Just as it impacted art, literature, and religion, the growing humanistic emphasis of the era, 1450 to 1750, shaped attitudes towards scientific thought. Scientists loosened their research from theories devised during ancient times and based their knowledge of natural world on direct observation and mathematics. This new vision of science that developed during the 16th and 17th centuries is known as the scientific revolution and reflects an epistemological shift in thinking, knowledge, and overall understanding of the natural world. Nowadays, we may often take scientific knowledge and understanding for granted, much like a faith. At times, we accept science blindly, assuming what it discovers, it must be true, and because much of it, the comforts of modern industrial life stems from scientific advancements. Even if we do not know how the science works or understand it, we trust and have faith that what science discovers is true. We trust that authority figures, scientists who undoubtedly will solve our problems or help us in some way, and that these experts will always find the answers to the questions we may have. And much like a faith or belief system, science has its own language. It operates on a plane of rationality, methodology, theories, systems, rules, laws, etc. Science offers a window and a path via the scientific method on making sense of the world we live in to its base mechanics, functionality, and ultimately bare bone facts. So how did we get there? The methods devised by scientists of these early modern times of the 16th and 17th centuries form the basis for science today. Mathematical formulation, empirical evidence, freedom of inquiry. This approach contrasted the classical medieval and Roman Catholic Church approved worldview of a fixed and perfect universe that could be understood from rational thought, Aristotle's postulations, and faith. Yet for the scientists of the scientific revolution whose freedom of inquiry led them to question the very nature of the universe, their findings often clashed with the common knowledge of their day. One of the first European scientists to experience this conflict was Nicholas Copernicus, a Polish monk and mathematician who based his early mathematical tables and models on those developed by Nasir al-Din, an Islamic scholar of the 13th century. Copernicus was commissioned by Pope Paul III to revise the Julian calendar, devised the during the time of Julius Caesar, to correct for slight inaccuracies that caused the calendar year to continuously lose time. Copernicus analyzed the astronomy underlying the calendar, which the Romans had based on the work of the Greek astronomer Ptolemy. Ptolemy believed that the Earth was at the center of the universe, and that all heavenly bodies revolved around it, including the sun and the moon. Ptolemy's theory had been adopted by the church as official doctrine, so to question Ptolemy was to also question the church. Based on his own empirical observations, Copernicus discovered that the Earth revolved around the sun. His formulations also revealed that the Earth turned on its axis every 24 hours, so that differences in night and day were not caused by the universe revolving around the Earth. Since his free inquiry led him into a direction contrary to church doctrine, he tested his developing theory over and over and over again, and revealed his outcomes just before his death. Even then, the findings were released only to a handful of scientists and mathematicians. Two astronomers that followed, Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler, used the Copernican model to develop a more comprehensive theory about the universe. Tycho Brahe made accurate and comprehensive astronomical and planetary observations using homemade astronomical instruments and to take many careful measurements. The empirical data he collected proved to be very useful to the mathematician Johannes Kepler, who developed laws and used mathematics to show that the Earth and other planets revolved around the Sun in elliptical orbits. Yet, unlike Copernicus, Kepler published his results as a relatively young man, fueling a controversy between religious officials and scientists. Protestant leaders criticized the new scientific models, too, with Martin Luther attacking Copernican model as early as 1539. The Catholic Church was a little slower to condemn it, but in 1610 it declared Copernicus's work as heresy, and by 1616 all writings that had claimed that the earth moved on its axis were forbidden to be taught or read. This course of events entangled an Italian astronomer, Galileo Galilei, as he turned the newly invented telescope toward the sky in 1609. The telescope had been created for optical purposes in the Netherlands, but Galileo was the first to use it to study the heavens where he discovered that the Milky Way is a huge collection of stars. The moon's light is reflected from the sun, and the Earth is not the only planet with moons. 
These discoveries and many more were disconcerting to the people of early modern Europe because they indicated that the Earth is nothing special and is only one of many heavenly bodies in the universe. For the religious, these discoveries implied that the Earth was not central to God's creation, and they called into question the belief that God's throne is in a fixed place in heaven. Galileo, like Copernicus, Brahe, and Kepler, stretched his own empirical observations, but more than earlier scientists, he wrote for a general audience, not just for scientists. His writings were in the vernacular of Italian as well, so the impact of his bold questioning of church doctrine was greater. In 1633, Galileo was tried by the church and found guilty of his teachings and his theories against the orders of the church. He was forced to recant his beliefs and spent the rest of his life, his life under house arrest. His book, The Starry Messenger, was put in the Index of Forbidden Books, and he was prohibited from publishing anything else on the subject of heavenly bodies and their movements. The final scientist had a little more luck when it came to public reception and thus the most famous European scientist of the era was Isaac Newton, whose late 17th century theories built on a work of his predecessors. In 1687, he published his Principia Mathematica, which built the framework of natural laws that had guided scientists through the 20th century. His books described the basic principles of motion and most famously, the universal law of gravity. Newton explained how his laws governed the universe, including the planetary orbits that Kepler had identified. He worked out mathematical formulas for the pull of gravity, and in doing so, greatly advanced the mathematical underpinnings of theoretical research. As complex as his formulas could be, he captured the vision of a natural universe in simple laws that helped to organize scientific thought for subsequent research. The scientific revolution combined with the Renaissance and the Reformation to transition Europe from medieval to modern times. Science had the biggest impact among educated Westerners first, while most people continue to believe traditional explanations of the natural world. For example, many people continue to believe that witches had supernatural powers to affect nature, and accusations of witchcraft were still taken seriously in courts of law during much of the 17th century. However, people eventually came to believe that their environment could be controlled by humans. Doctors promoted a more scientific approach to illness and publicly denounced popular healers. Writers began to question religious miracles, and some intellectuals rethought conceptions of God through the explanation that divinity set natural laws in motion, a system of thought called deism. Science had certainly been important in other areas in different parts of the world. For example, China had long been a source of innovative thought about the nature of the universe. However, the Chinese approach was generally a practical one, and their interest in science was based on its perceived usefulness. The thinkers of the European scientific revolution were enthralled with the idea of general laws of nature that could explain broad patterns that the ancient Greeks, Romans, and Islamic scholars before them had also been interested in. More than anything, these new scientists were absolutely convinced that it was fully within the reasoning power of human beings to understand and by implication to control the vast workings of the universe.